When we started this Broman Crusade, we hypothesized that it would either be a long, slow grinding defeat for the forces of the Bromans, or a lightning victory, and it looks like we're shaping up to have the latter. But it's not over yet. Before we get into the map situation, let's take a look at the results of our last battle. Of course, that was a fight between the forces of uh, Force Banquo and Force Cherub. Banquo, for those of you that never no didn't notice this yet, the three forces for the, uh, the Vampire Lord Blanc were Julius, Desdemona, and Banquo. Those are three ghosts that appeared in Shakespeare's plays. See how we go with a little theme there? And you gotta be a little erudite, you gotta be literate, you gotta be educated to play these games, or at least to follow this channel. We ain't no dopes here in the House of Wargaming. Neither of you guys are our viewers. Appreciate you coming along for the ride. So our last couple of fights, Force Banquo beat back two of those armies. And fundamentally, I think it's because we didn't have, when I set the campaign up, I didn't have the figures for banners, champions, musicians. If the undead had had those, things would have gone way different. Would have been a whole lot more casualties. Let's take a look at the casualties from the last fight. Lord Blanc lost all of his dire wolves, all ten of them. I'm missing one. I don't know where it went to. He scampered off somewhere. He lost his bats. His, this is another bat. Um, it's a stand-in. You guys were there for it. Ten, twenty, thirty-seven skeletons. And his necromancer. That's a huge defeat right there. That's going to be big. They are all out of the campaign. On the other side of the ledger, you had the Bromans lose a couple of knights. They lost all of their peasants. No big loss there. Low leadership. Not the best. The big thing is they lost the crew of one of their cannons. Now, they have both cannons, but, you know, it's going to be a little slow getting those into position. They also lost, as you can see here in the front, ten spearmen. Now, five of those spearmen are permanent casualties. We leave five, and then again, one of these knights is a permanent casualty. Since the peasants ran off and they're kind of chumps, they're just out of the campaign. But these other five spearmen will come back in two weeks. We're not going to worry about that because the campaign will be over in two weeks. The Bromans are going to launch a lightning strike on Castle Gallagher. That is the Vampire Lord Blanc's home. And they're only about a day's march away from there. But that second fight took place... Well, the first one took place on the 26th. The, seven, the second fight took place on the 27th of March... And then we got to take a day off because we got to recover our dead, patch them up, get them together. So that's going to be the 28th. On the 29th, Force Cherub can, they can use, uh, who, who is the, um, their, their, their wizard can sanctify the barrel mound and purify it. And then on the 30th, they can move out. Now, curiously enough, Seraph is just a few miles down the road here. So by the 31st, oh, here, look. On April 1st, they're going to be able to invest Castle Gallagher, turning our attention over to Force Archangel. On the 30th of March, they were able to reach this point right here. And so then we get to the 1st, and oh look, they're going to get to Castle Gallagher on April 2nd. So April 3rd is likely going to be the, the big hoopty. We're going to have some fun with that. We're going to play around with the siege rules from the Warhammer 6th edition rulebook. But we got a couple of things to cover before that. The first thing we should talk about is what the forces look like that will be participating. And if we step back and kind of run the numbers, take a little census, Lord Blanc is only down to 49 skeletons and 15 zombies. He does have two thralls, also himself. Now, Lord Blanc is a vampire lord, is a level 3 spellcaster. But he is going up against High Priest Rickley and the Battle Mage McGram, who are level 3 and level 2. So when it comes to the Siege, he is grossly outclassed, but there's something else we need to think about. Uh, you'll notice here that I've got, I've got a little stroke mark here between the 48 and 11. That's a total of 59 skeletons. Remember in the battle how Thrall Pualton, Dane Pualton, was able to run away and drag a whole bunch of skeletons with him. Well, that looks like this on the map. This is where the battle was fought. And remember that Dane ran across country to this road and blitzed up to Castle Gallagher. He's going to be able to make it there in plenty of time. He'll be there on the 28th. Now, I checked. If we count the numbers, 29, and then on the 30th, he's he actually, while this battle is being fought, I checked. Thrall Korinsky can run up to this this cemetery and recruit another batch of zombies, 
He will be doing that like on the 25th, 26th, and he still has plenty of time to get back down to Castle Gallagher. And see, I wrote here that he's going to arrive on the 1st of April, which is pretty much the same time. So maybe a bit of a foot race, but we're going to give it to him because that means that in addition to the 15 zombies that Lord Blanc started with, he's going to be able to have an additional 10 plus a D10. So another 14. So he will start with 29 zombies, and that is important. Because the Bromans have General Sam out, Captain Thorn, Captain Legan, High Priest Rickley, Wizard McGram, the Battle Master, the Battle Wizard, like we talked about. They also have a total of 15 swordsmen. Look at these numbers. 31 archers, 81 spearmen, 6 knights of the lamb, 6 questing knights, if you will. The Canon Elijah. They also have the Canon Moses, but Moses doesn't have a crew. So we're going to break that down. Here's what we're going to do, just to kind of thin that, those numbers out a little bit. First of all, I this is a total of 51 archers, and what what is this? Oh, no, it's 31 archers and 81 spearmen. I don't have 81 spearmen figures. So what we're going to do is we're going to use these numbers to assault the castle. When we go to attack the castle, we'll have 15 swordsmen, 20 archers, 60 spearmen, and then six of each kind of knights, except... Going back to the map, we still have a cemetery, Wiggly Hill, another barrel mound, and another barrel mound down here. So what we're going to do to completely purify the land is break our Broman forces into two sections. We're going to have an assault force take on Castle Gallagher, and we're going to send a, a small strike force around to just spend... It's going to be a couple of days blessed, a couple of days blessed, a couple of days blessed. This is going to take two weeks, and, and our wounded are going to, I guess, go with them just to kind of make the numbers easier so we don't have to stress out too much about the math. What that means is we can break our Broman force into two forces, 11 archers, 20 spearmen, 21 actually, six knights of the lamb, Captain Manstill, and the wizard McGram. These guys are all going to go run that circuit where these guys will participate in the assault. The big thing with the assault, though, is, and Lord Blanc is not stupid. He understands that with a cannon, he's doomed. Because they are so badly outnumbered and because the Bromans have a cannon, they're... Because the skeletons are so badly outnumbered and the Bromans have two cannons, although only one crew, to be fair... That means in fairly short order, they're going to be able to reduce this castle to rubble, unless Lord Blanc takes action. And that action is to sally forth and see if he can damage those cannons beyond repair. That would force the Bromans to assault the castle walls with nothing more than ladders, battering ram, siege towers, probably going to take too long to build. But when you look at this, like, like we can use boiling oil. This is a great equalizer. Dump it, you know, maybe the skeletons have one or two of those they can dump and wipe out some numbers. And really, it, it's going to be an interesting scenario. But in order to add a little bit of interest and maybe even play around with the skirmish rules in Warhammer 6th Edition, we can do that night raid on the artillery. But before we get to the nitty gritty of how that scenario is going to work, we should take a look at Henry Hyde's wargaming campaigns because April 2nd. I think it's like the eight, night of April 1st. I, it, it's fine. It's, we're we're going to start, and it's been like eight months since we've run any of these games. So I, I think we're okay rolling for new random events. One for the Bromans, one for the Skeletons, and these events will take place throughout the duration of the siege. So rolling first for the Bromans, we get a 71, which on this table is no effect. So nothing for the Bromans, and what about for our Skeletons? On an 82, the commissary has a stroke of luck, supplies are more plentiful, the troops have extra spring in their strep, and movement rates are increased by 10% on the march and in battle. Morale increases, and the troops have a plus one bonus in any engagement. All right, so where we're, what we're going to do with that is we will allow the... Well, first of all, this, this morale to plus one bonus, I kept forgetting. we got to reduce the losses on the morale phase by one. But, but this time, we'll say that it's, it's cursed ground, and we'll, we'll use that rule again. The increase in speed will be interesting, and I don't know how you add 10%, given that all of our movement rates are like 2 inches. Is it 2 and a quarter? That might be huge, considering that we're going to have a whole lot of zombies on the table, especially for our night raid. Now, remember when I broke this out, 
So Lord Blanc is going to send 11 skeletons and 14 zombies to kill the crew of Elijah, the cannon. Oh, but they still have Moses. So ideally, we want to kill the crew. What we're going to do is we're going to start the zombies over here on this side of the table. And down here where it says Elijah, we're going to put a little campground, a little campsite and Elijah right next door to it. And the zombies are going to be sent down to capture Elijah and kill the crew. On the first turn, we're going to start with nine zombies. And then on the second turn, five more zombies will come in and they'll move down. Now, zombies are not smart. So the zombies will, on a, each zombie, will roll a d6. And on one or a two, they'll drift 45 degrees left. On a five or six, 45 degrees right. And on a three or four, they'll just go straight down. And what that means is that you're going to slowly develop this horde kind of marching down in a line. On turn number three, the skeletons will appear. And the skeletons will march straight for Elijah. But wait a minute. What kind of game is this? You're just going to send these undead down and they're going to bust in? Well, first of all, I'm going to put a little bit of terrain on the table. Um, I, I haven't decided exactly how to do that yet. Tune in next time. But also, just because an army is camped outside a castle doesn't mean they're dumb enough not to set sentries out. So we're going to roll and we'll probably do like, I don't know, maybe like, like D3 plus 1 sentries out here. And we can put those out in the middle zone, and it's a dark and foggy night. Lord Blanc summons up the Darkling Fog, and visibility is limited to six inches. Uh, all movements will be like normal movements. So these guys will be moving at four. The zombies will be moving four inches per turn. The skeletons, and again, the skeletons can't march. Oh, but you know, it'll be four and a half inches because of that move boost, won't it? Key thing here is that once... Combat is enjoined. Oh, and we'll use this, the normal sentry rules. We'll roll a d8, and sentries will move one to four inches in a random direction. We can use the direction. So in this case, oh look, if I roll for this guy, he's going to move three and a half inches in that direction, and he's looking in that direction. If there's a zombie or a skeleton within six inches of him, then he can use the rest of his movement to get closer. And once combat is enjoined, the alarm is sounded, and once the alarm is sounded, we can bring reinforcements on. And we can even have one, two, and three reinforcement points for them to come on. And on a one, we'll bring out a knight. And on a two, we'll bring out D6 archers. Actually, let's make that D3 knights. That would be a really good one for them. D3 of these heavy hitters is going to be huge, and it might preserve Elijah, and we get to use the cannon in the siege. Although I think that's going to end the siege pretty quickly, but hey, it, that's all right. We're going we're gonna to play this out to its conclusion. On a 2, we'll have d6 archers. On a 3, d6 swordmen. On a 4, d6 spearmen. On a 5 or a 6, nobody comes to help. So you get a whole bunch of different like power levels of coming on, different uh, numbers of people coming in in different areas, and we'll just roll once for each group of people. And then it becomes kind of an interesting mini game for how do I use these sentries... And what did I say here? I said, um, oh, five, five sentries. There it is. So one, two, three, four, five. And they'll kind of wander around. Things are going to get jumbled and mixed up. Those skeletons have a little bit more brains than the zombies. So the skeletons will move immediately down here. And if we can get to the tent, if the alarm is sounded, then these three guys will stand outside. They'll, they'll basically guard the cannon. They'll come out. So we'll put the tent like right here. We'll put the cannon right next to it. And once the alarm is sounded, these three guys come out. And they're going to stand guard right there, protect the cannon, and so they can continue to fight. Once skeletons get by here, and it'll be one-to-one -one fights, once skeletons and zombies get into contact with the cannon, they can spike it and ruin it for the siege. Now, they won't be able to destroy it completely, but they will be able to, just like, we'll, we'll say, like, one attack doing one wound. Forget how many wounds it usually has. Just one attack with one wound will be enough to ruin the cannon for the siege. In fact, we might have to do, if we could do two, then we've spiked both guns. And then we don't care what happens. This is a suicide mission for the zombies and skeletons. I'm going through all of this in a lot more detail here so that next time we get together, the next fight that we have, we can just get stuck in. You guys have already seen what's happening. And at the start of the video, I can say, hey, if you want to know how we set this up, go look at the last video. That's my rationale. That's my justification. So we've got 25 undead and I don't and only five spearmen to start. And I don't know how many extra resources they're going to get. If they get really lucky, they could get D3 knights right here. And those knights can just rampage. We'll play until all 25 of the undead are killed 
or until both cannons are destroyed, or until all three of these guys are killed. And remember, they may run away. If, if the result of this is there's only one crew member, then that means the cannon is going to operate much, much slower. So that may give Lord Blanc additional time to think up new skirmish scenarios and new raids to run with his troops before we actually set up some walls and fight a proper siege. But that's kind of my thinking on this penultimate uh, episode of the campaign and how we'll run it and kind of keep it fair and also how we'll limit the number of figures that are on the table. I ain't got 80 spearmen. Okay, good. I'm going to send 20 of them off on a little uh, road trip and then, uh, you know, I can kind of feed them in a little at a time. Maybe I've only got three units of 20 and I've got one in reserve. And once I lose 20 spearmen, then I can pile up those 20 that I've lost and send another wave in against the walls. So that's kind of the rationale and justification. I hope you guys will tune in I had a few days, maybe next week, when we run this Sally Forth, the night raid for the undead. Till the, if you have any suggestions, hit me up, man. Let me know in the comments. It's nighttime. Do we give these guys a minus one to their weapon skill? I don't think we have to do that. I think it's pretty even as it stands. But if you got ideas, throw them down there. You know, people come along and they'll read it and they'll have ideas for their own little mini skirmish scenarios for Warhammer 6th Edition. Till then, I'm praying for you. <laughs>